it is in Christ alone that we stand faultless before the throne. But we are also called to be part of church, to be together. In Hebrews uh, chapter 10 we read this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on uh, toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And, and you know, we, we will have read those words and we will have heard them, and you will also have heard me say that, you know, that was the teaching program that Mary and her committee had put together when I joined the Christian Union, and that's what was talked about for, you know, the whole of the first term. Um, and, you know, encouraging us as students to, to meet together. But um, I wonder, uh, rather than us thinking just for a moment about what it means for us to do, what does it mean to you when, you know, others spur you on toward <coughs> love and good deeds? When you're on the receiving end, of this, when you have others uh, come and meet with you, we all know, I'm sure perhaps we don't all know actually, that you know, 18 months ago there weren't this number of people meeting here on a Sunday morning. You know, it is encouraging that there are more of us here today. and. Uh, yeah, how, how does that feel for those of you who were here in those days? That we, you know, there are more of us. Um, how do we feel when others meet with us? How does it feel? What does it mean to us to be encouraged by others, as I mentioned, first thing at the beginning of the service? And as we think about what it means to us to be on the receiving end, now to commit to do the delivering, if you like. I've, uh, I thought it would be good for us to take something away, to just to remind ourselves that we have stuck in, in our Bibles. So I just wonder whether, would you give everybody one of those? Thank you. And it just, just changing the word, just going back to the other side. What does it mean for you to spur others on toward love and good deeds? What does it mean to, for you to meet together? What does it mean to uh, encourage one another? I know that there are people sat in front of me who have said, I really must try and get to church for every Sunday. And they have. And that's really encouraging. That's encouraging to me that they have. But actually, do you need to write that down? Do you need to think about the other activities that church does? What do you do on a Wednesday morning? Could you start coming to coffee morning and encourage the people who do that? Could you come on a Wednesday night to our Bible study? Could you join us online tonight and Sunday nights in our prayer meeting? Would that be what it is to meet together? How can you encourage other people? How can you spur others on toward love and good deeds? And it's not going to be the same for all of us. It can't be the same for all of us. We live in different places. We are at different stages of our lives. We have different things going on. But maybe there is something in terms of uh, a covenant that uh, we need to make with one another for this coming year. So, I'll just give you a few minutes. If you're on live on Zoom, it's on the screen. The questions are there on the screen and you can perhaps find a scrap of paper or the back of your Bibles 
and uh, write it in there. I showed you last week a um, Bible that I was given when I first became a Christian. And one of the things, when I dug that off the shelf last week, I just realised how much I used to write in there at different bits, and it's just full of stuff to remind me. And maybe, you know, this slip of paper can be stuck in your Bible somewhere. It's a bit hard when you read it on your phone or on a tablet, isn't it? But um, we need to remind ourselves at times. So just give you a minute or two just to write things down. It's always the back row, usually on the right hand side. <laughs> You can come back to this, but I'm just going to pray these verses as they as they've been put by uh, Peterson in the uh, the message. So let's just pray. So let's do it, full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. God, you always keep your word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out, not avoiding worshipping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. And, and Lord, we want to be people who encourage and spur one another on, who worship you together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as well as encouraging ourselves, we also, uh, as a church, pray for those who are out in the mission field. And Dave is just going to come and share. Um, I contacted Judith Skelton, who's down in Nigeria, and said, we want to pray for you on Sunday. So she sent an email. Um, which uh, we, I've just printed one copy, Dave's got that, I'll stick it up on, on the board afterwards. But Dave will just share that and other, uh, just remind us of others who we pray for and support. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. As a church, we do support other ministry organizations and individuals. Um, as you know, every fifth Sunday in a month, and there are five Sundays, the last one usually goes to the ministry support. We have supported, and we still do support, uh, the following. Good news for everyone. City Mission, Groundbreakers, other projects, there's Renewal Northwest. Uh, tools for the mission, we have supported that work. Um, we also have supported Christian Prison Resourcing. We've supported Steve and Angela with Rolling Projects. we also supported the message. And of recent, we, as Dave mentioned, we supported Judith Skelton. And the last mystery giving in October, 
to send Judith a gift of hundred pounds. Uh, this is the newsletter that we got uh, email today. <clears throat> I'll just read it out and then I'll stick it on the back of the board. You can have a look at it. Okay. Thanks so much for all the love, encouragement, prayer, and financial support. I noticed that there was some more money put in my account this week. Thank you, it's so appreciated. I'm hoping to write a prayer letter at some point next week, but for now, here's a few things on my mind. I've arrived. Even when I sat on the first flight, I couldn't quite believe it. All my luggage arrived, which is not a given thing here. There have been three people since I came who haven't had their luggage yet. I'm slowly starting to settle in and figure out how things work. School starts tomorrow, so I'm excited to finally get started. I have a lovely office with lots of windows, and it looks out onto our green space with lots of palm trees and other trees. Such a nice place to work. My confidence in driving is slowly growing. I love where I live. The compound is a little haven from the craziness of life here. It's beautiful, spacious, and used by both the expat and local communities, so it feels there's life here, but without the chaos. Driving terrifies me. I can't describe the chaos. Somehow it works most of the time, but it feels like anarchy. I'm also terrified of the police stopping me because I won't understand what they're saying to me. Police stops happen all the time. God has been kind and I've managed to avoid it so far, but it's coming. I'm trying to receive God's peace in this area and it's getting better. But please pray for protection as there are so many near accidents all the time. I'm building relationships with staff at school. They're lovely, but there's a lot of different cultures and languages and ways of doing things and staff have been in survival mode for so long now. Pray I'm a blessing and not a bulldozer, that I take things slowly and work at the right pace for staff here. Pray I learn culture well. There is so much new stuff. I'm constantly making mistakes, which I hate, but it's far for the cause. Pray I can manage the mistake. Pray I can let the mistakes go and move on quickly. Tomorrow marks the first day of normal. School seems to cool with all the students in. We've lost about 50% of our intake, so it's a much smaller school. There's a lot of grief and exhaustion, to, so pray students settle well and routines, etc. are built quickly. And continue to pray for the cool situation. Life is fairly normal here. It's been peaceful from the start. The junta released the president's son yesterday, which we're hoping might ease some of the sanctions. There's rumors that Niger will run out of money this month. No one ever imagined that the country would survive this long after the coup, but the junta seems to be doing a good job. I don't understand how the country will run out of money, but the sanctions are severe and people are worried. Pray for a breakthrough in the negotiations. Lots of people are saying that the prosperity of the country so far is due to Christians praying. So let's keep praying God, praying for God's peace and rule to reign in this beautiful country. There's so much more I could write, but that's probably a good start. Thanks, Judy. Maybe you could just pray for this uh, and then I'll put it on the back of the book. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful news that we received from Judith, Father, and the difficulty that <clears throat> is experiencing in that country, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that she's got there safely. Thank you, Lord, that she's uh, in culture and learning the language. Pray, Lord, that she will settle in quickly. No, Lord, she said that she constantly making mistakes, Lord, but that's understandable in a different country different culture, different language. Pray, Lord, that you give her the wisdom and the encouragement that she needs to learn the language quickly. We're going to pray for the cool situation, Lord. Pray, Lord, that 
life um, will return to normal soon. Pray to Lord that you give her the peace that she needs and for your peace that rules red in that beautiful country. There's much more, Lord, that we can pray, but we just hand these things to you now, Lord. And just thank you for, for the people that we're able to support as a church, different organizations that we are able to support. Thank you for that, and thank you for blessing us financially as well. That's a fellowship. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dave. All of these uh, people are in different situations and difficult situations that they find themselves in. June is perhaps easy for us to think it's difficult, but uh, you know everything, all the different places that, that we support, uh, we need to keep them in our prayers. We're just going to read God's Word. We're going to read John six. Uh, and if you're flicking through, you might want to sort of put a finger in Joshua 24 as well, because we're going to read from there as well. So John 6, starting at verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in him. And you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is our teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit of life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have come, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And then turning to Joshua 24. And I'll try and click. Joshua 24, verses 14 to 18. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors, worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery. 
and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we travelled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. So, Sunday school. You want to? Yeah, we're going to do communion after I've spoken, so I apologise. Sorry. It just it fits better today. Shall we just pray? Heavenly Father, we pray that as we look at your word, you might open our eyes and unblock our ears that we might hear from you. Be with Sunday school as well, we, we pray. Speak through the activities that they're doing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Reading the Bible is not always easy. But we've got a title today, which is, Do You Want To? John gives us discussion between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. It's not easy for us to understand, and, and basically his disciples and followers didn't get it either, really. Early on in Mary's life at King's College in London, sat, I think, in the Nelson Mandela um, building, which uh, was a uh, student union cafe area dedicated to Nelson Mandela. Um, she was drinking tea um, and talking to other students doing religious studies, but largely theology. And they were debating between themselves, the theology students, if the bread and wine totally or partially became Jesus' actual body and blood, and did it happen when the bell was rung and all sorts of things. And my beautiful wife piped up, I don't really understand why the debate, when they're only symbols, what's really very reassuring is that she's not the only one in our marriage to have been called a heretic in that hallowed centre of theological learning. Jesus, in this passage, is mixing spiritual truth with physical experience, I think. Um, and we might say, well, is that allowed? I mean, especially today in our thinking, surely our world today does not require such an approach just want you to think just for a minute about this picture. This picture is from the Hubble Space Telescope. The image represents the galaxies evenly distributed across space as seen by that telescope up in space. But I might be putting a pin in a balloon for you here. But those colours that the software has chosen to apply to various intensities of radio waves uh, that it's captured, those colours aren't actually floating around out there in the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope captures radio waves Something that exists but, but can't be seen, can't be felt. And it converts it into an image that our brains can process. That image, to be honest, is no more a true representation of what the universe looks like than this one. This one was labelled in the media this week as an artist's impression of the galaxies out there in the universe, challenging the perceived understanding that the galaxies are evenly distributed. 
personal opinion, and I know it's always iffy to make personal opinion when you preach, but anyway, here we go. Why would God scatter the, the, the galaxies evenly? That sort of suggests to me some sort of random distribution, as though God's just done that, and they've all sort of separated out nice and neatly. God seems to me to be far more into pattern and order. And so actually I prefer the second image, that there might well be order and pattern to how the galaxies are laid out. Anyway, back to John's Gospel. It seems as if this discussion causes so much friction that Jesus' ministry might well be on the rocks. Followers are leaving. It's on the verge of collapse. Perhaps they're questioning if they have been enabled by the Father to follow Jesus. Maybe they're confused. Maybe they're running a touch scared that the Jewish leaders may be right. Here in this town on the water's edge, Peter's home, Peter's town, the town where men were first called to, from fishing for fish to fish for men, the, it's the only uh, excavated site in Galilee where there is a house with external steps onto the roof. We know what that was about, don't we? This town that has a substantial synagogue that shows remarkable evidence of reconstruction on a number of occasions. This town where so much has happened and so much more will happen. Jesus turns to his disciples, the twelve, and asks the million dollar question. You do not want to leave too, do you? Full on, in their faces. I apologise if you're catching up with traitors, but maybe a slight, um, whatever they call it, what do they call it when you give it away like I did last night to our friend? Spoiler. Maybe a slight spoiler. If you haven't watched episode six, cover your ears. It, it, it's a little bit like, but far more significant than when Anthony on Friday night on Traitors said, by eliminating me, it becomes 8-1 to the Traitors. It's like Jesus knew what was happening here and he challenged his disciples you do not want to leave too do you i wonder whether jesus had in mind that passage from joshua it's not the first time we've visited it in the in the last year is it if serving the lord joshua says seems undesirable to you then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve isn't it great for us? We can read these words in Joshua, we can read Jesus' words in John's Gospel, and we can sit here and feel how nice it is to be reminded that God dealt with the disciples and the people of Israel in this way. The history of our faith teaches us so much about how they needed to change. It's not us squirming between two options challenged by Joshua or by Jesus the one we know we need to make and the one that is more convenient to make but what if God is asking us this question today let me say that again what if God is asking us this question today and a decision is called for. Could we honestly face ourselves? What would happen if I, like Joshua, were to demand that you chose to serve gods of the past or gods of our present world or admit and serve the God that we know is good? Are you ready to stop choosing to sin, stop Choosing, chasing after the false gods of this age and get serious about your faith? Or what if you were asked by God, 
do you want to go away as well? Or are you ready to embrace the great mysteries of our faith and be shepherded, shepherded by God into places that could lead to death or worse? To being mocked for believing that which is scandalous and perhaps from the world's view, silly. I mean, do we really comprehend the depth of what it means for God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit to not just be the source for life, but the source and meaning of that life? Do we really want to look into what it means to be in a covenant relationship with God? Are we willing to be honest, to look at our lives and consider the depth of our commitment to God? To look not just at Sunday between 11 and 12.30, but to look at Monday morning at 11, sitting perhaps in a doctor's office? Are we ready to look at 2am when our sleep is broken by the worries of life? What about Friday night between 7 and midnight, or for those of us over 40, 9.30? Do our lives testify to a desire that answers those questions as the apostles and the people of Israel do? If not, are we willing to renew the relationship as God would demand and welcome? As we let the question sink in at a personal level, let's just take a quick look at um, some of the questions. Who's asking this? I mean, I wonder if who asks us to make the decision to choose, or who asks us if we are going to leave makes the difference. I mean, if I were to ask you, I imagine that most of you would, uh, like I would, should the pastor of another church ask me, respond with an enthusiastic yes. Of course I would recognise God is good and that all other gods are worthless. And would I ever leave God behind and go after something less demanding, less challenging, easier to understand? Like the Apostle Peter, I would hastily reply, no, I would never ever, ever, ever leave you, Lord. I was thinking of a friend who took that line 25 years ago and has turned his back on Jesus because of the distraction that led him to leave his wife and to marry somebody, an Orthodox Jew. And he's had to turn his back not just on his wife and his kids, but his faith as well. Of course we won't. But what is up to? What if we were face to face with God and it was him asking you to commit to a relationship with him, a relationship that had some level of accountability, some demand for interaction, some demand for transparent intimacy. Basically, what would our response be? Would we be faithful to him? and grow in our love and service. I mean, if we answered God positively, how then do we deal with the times where, you know, we don't hold up our part of the deal? How do we deal with the transparency that we can control with one another, but not with God? Who remembers that? What's that? Yeah? It's a VHS video cassette. Back in the day, back in the day, we used to talk about there being a video recorded of our lives that only God could see. Because 
we could get cameras and put those cassettes in and we would think about it and we don't tend to think about it and say way these days we stream and rarely record but you know what it's still a really worthy illustration God knows your life may be an open book but there is stuff that you will know about your life and I don't there is nothing though about your life that God doesn't know our lives are not hidden from him and he still loves us. And that brings us to the need for renewal. There was sin. There will be temptation. So where does renewal fit in? I mean, if like me, the times uh, I have tried to respond to God by my own strength or wisdom are numerous. The times when my emotions drove me to my knees to enthusiastically commit my way to God or to confess him in front of others. So many times I thought that my faithfulness would move mountains. Only God would let me have the power and then get out my way. The only problem is that most of the time, well, okay, all of the time, my good intentions were not supported by my actions. And left me open to failure. Just like the Israelites in Joshua's day, and like Peter in the Gospel, we have two problems the sins of the past and the temptations of the future. Remember, by the time the book of Joshua starts, the people of God had wandered around in the desert for 40 years. They had struggled with being faithful to the pledge they made at Mount Sinai when they were marked as God's people with the blood of the sacrifice that would cover their sin. After Joshua leads them into God's holy land, the place set apart for them to celebrate in his presence as he provided for them, they would be tempted time and time again. So often they would choose to do what was right in their eyes or in the eyes of their neighbours who chased false gods not do what was right in God's eyes. And Peter was no different. A loud and often wrong man, his intention to serve God was not well tempered. Peter had the nerve to tell Jesus that Jesus didn't need to die for us. He fell for the temptation to fight to defend Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, slicing off a guy's ear. I wonder whether he was trying to take his head off. Sometimes wonder why God puts up with our failures, especially for those of us who swear we love him. Why not just be done with us? For the failures can sometimes crush us or we harden ourselves to them, tired of having to ask for forgiveness over and over again. In theology speak, we need to renew the covenant. We need to do what Joshua calls on Israel to do, and what the apostles realised they need to understand and see the covenant anew, to hear again the incredible promises of God for those he has called, or to use God's words, granted the right to come into his presence, to be quickened, given life by the Holy Spirit, to be faced with the promise. So we can come wherever we're at. We need to realise that God hasn't removed us from his people. The promise he gave us when we first trusted in the Lord Jesus hasn't disappeared because of our stumbling around in sin or sometimes being unfaithful. Does this excuse our behaviour? No, absolutely not. But we're pointed to this fable where God's faithfulness is demonstrated. He's our host. He's the very nourishment we need. We see the covenant as if it is brand new. Our sins are forgiven. He calls us to this feast. Broken sinners made whole. People who struggle with what is right. Who need God's love 
and care and here at this table we receive it. Ten times you know in the gospel it notes that our life is found in Christ. We are promised to live forever should we be nourished by God. We are told his flesh is the bread that is the life of the world. Without being sustained by his body and blood, there is no life in us, and we are not promised to be raised on the last day. In the Bible, there are two words for life. First is bios, which, from which comes biology. The sort of physical, mechanical facts of life. Blood flowing throughout the body. But the second word, which I think is probably pronounced zoe or zoe, is far different. It is cognitive, conscious, the, the life of existing, the kind of life that has meaning and definition. This is the life that is given, that is generated, begotten in us by the very work of God, the kind of life that enters into a relationship and is capable of finding incredible joy and incredible pain in the midst of those relationships, especially the relationship we were both together created to have with God. And yes, like any relationship, sin can mar it and cause pain and even doubt and a sense that it is broken. It is because of this that we need to be reassured and find the covenant and its promises renewed. This then is the place of covenant renewal. It's not so much that we re-pledge our faith or recommit, as much as the place where we are renewed, the place where we are strengthened, reminded and sustained by the very body and blood which was given and shed for us. Renewed that we might again cry out in praise and wonder, realising that God is our God who has renewed the covenant. That because of the covenant, we can be, he can be our soul's desire. It is his faithfulness that sustains it and calls us back and strengthens us. But Peter said it, where else is there to go? You have the words of life. Before we come to the table, I'm going to end by reading a quote from Thomas Kempis. Getting quickly that, yes, I know he's a Catholic thinker. But hear these words. He's quoting scripture. Let them stick to your heart and mind. Come to me, all you that labour and are burdened, and I will refresh you. The bread that which I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Take you and eat. This is my body which shall be delivered for you. Do this for the commemoration of me. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me and I in him. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. He goes on to say, these are all your words. O Christ, eternal truth. Though they were not all spoken at one time nor written together in one place, and because they are yours and true, I must accept them all with faith and gratitude. They are yours and you have spoken them. They are mine also because you have spoken them for my salvation. Gladly I accept them from your lips that they may be the more deeply impressed in my heart. Words of such tenderness, so full of sweetness and love, encourage me, but my sins frighten me and an unclean conscience thunders at me when approaching such great mysteries as these. The sweetness of your words invites me, but the multitude of my vices oppresses me. You command me to approach you confidently if I wish to have part with you and to receive the food of immortality if I desire to obtain life and glory everlasting. Come to me, you say, all you that labour and are 
burden and I will refresh you. Oh, how sweet and kind to the ear of the sinner is the word by which you, my Lord God, invite the poor and needy to receive your most holy body. Who am I, Lord, that I should presume to approach you? Behold, the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, and yet you say, Come, all of you, to me. Come and know that there is an incredible peace between you and your God, the peace which passes all understanding and guards you, heart and mind, as you are in Christ Jesus. This table reminds us that it is not about us, about how well we keep our promise to follow him, about how faithful we are. It is all about Jesus, about his death, his resurrection, his ascension. He has paid the price for my sin and yours. And as we choose to follow him today, tomorrow and all our tomorrows, he is faithful. Even when we fail, he welcomes us back. Here we remember that it is his body broken for us, his blood poured out in forgiveness for our sin. Here we remember the promise of eternal life. And with Joshua, I want to come to this table this morning and every time we come this year and say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So Father, as we come to this table and remember Jesus, we remember his body broken for us. Take this in remembrance of me. That was what Jesus said. Let us remember him today. As ever, keep the bread until we've all got it to so eat together. Let's eat together and remember Jesus died for us. Amen. We just thank God for the, the cup. We thank you, Lord, that I remember myself uh, being uh, accused of heresy when I uh, discussed uh, this. Uh, 
that the, uh, the, the wine or the <coughs> juice is symbolic. Um, um, uh, Lord, we know that it represents, Lord, that the, the, the blood that was poured out for us. Uh, Lord, uh, I just thank you, Lord, for, for dying for us and, and, and then that we can drink of your blood in this symbolic way. Uh, in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 together the blood of Christ. We are going to sing again, not our final song, because we will sing again at, uh, right at the end, but we're just going to sing uh, before we pray, and then we'll, we will sing, and I'll explain the final song, but Mary song that sums up, I love you Lord, your mercy never fails me, all my days I've been held in your hands. 